Good morning, Grace Church. God bless you. We are so excited to share with you in this worship experience. Do me a favor, if you would, help a preacher out and help a church out. Come on, would you share this watch party with somebody? Invite a friend in that you know that might need to hear a word from God, might need to uh, join us in on this worship experience. Can you share it with me? Not only with that, if you're just happy to be alive one more day, one more time to worship God, come on, hit that like button for me. Come on, if you're happy about being in the house of God, hit that heart button as well. Come on, invite somebody in. Let's have an awesome time as we enter into worship. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I love what the saints of old would say. They would say, if I had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough to worship and praise you, God. But since you gave me one more day, one more chance, one more opportunity, uh, one more time to fill these lungs up with air, God, I'm going to use it to worship you. I'm going to use it to praise your most wonderful and holy name. Would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer of invocation? Kind Father, once again, your people come, Lord, in anticipation to feel your presence. God, but we come, Lord, um, scarred. We come, God, not perfected, Lord, but seeking perfection through you. And God, and the only way we do that is through your Holy Spirit and camping and dwelling around us. So, God, we pray in the name of Jesus. Would you, would you come into this worship experience, God, Lord, whether they're on their couch, whether they're, Father God, still in the bed, God, they might be at the kitchen table, they might be driving in the car, Lord, whatever it is, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would saturate that place, God, in the name of Jesus, God, flood it, Father God, with your mighty ruha, your mighty power, your dunamis power, God, let somebody be healed, set free, saved, and delivered, God, Lord, encourage somebody, God, we invite you in, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, we're going to let the glory of the Lord rise among us. And we believe that the glory of the Lord will speak. And we're going to let it rise. Come on, will you join in with us as we attempt to touch the throne of God this morning? Come on, everybody, real simple. Let the glory of the Lord, here we go. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us and the praises of our knees rise among us let it rise and the glory of the Lord Let the glory of the Lord, here we go. Let the glory of the Lord. Time. Let the glory of the Lord rise upon us, everybody. Let the glory of the Lord.
about you, but mighty is the works of the Lord's hands. Come on, if you know that his hands have just been working all over you, I dare you just lift them right where you are. Don't be ashamed. Come on, just lift your hands right where you are. Say, God, I thank you for your hands. Come on. God, I thank you for your hands moving all over me. I lift my hands. God praise. Amen. Listen, we are so excited that we're worshiping this morning with God. But I'm definitely excited that our friend and our sister would come and, and share with us. And so we're going to ask that Pastor Valerie would lead us in the rest of worship.
Provide the fire. Yes, God. Yes, God. And I'll provide the sacrifice. If you pour out your spirit, then I will open up inside. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me
on, can we worship God? Come on, can we worship him right where you are? Come on, come on, come on, worship him right where you are. Come on, I dare you to give God your best praise right there in your living room. Come on, give God your best praise. Come on, give him your best praise. Come on, God, fill me up so that all might see, Lord, that it's you. God, and I can glorify your name. Come on, come on, God, come on, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your divine presence being in this place. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, God, even now. God, Lord, we thank you for the move of the Spirit that's happening, God. Every place, God, where everybody is hearing, God, right now in the name of Jesus. So, God, we thank you for your visitation. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. We thank God for the powerful praise and worship. I want to share with you, as the Spirit will give us guidance from the book of Haggai, the second chapter, beginning, if you will, with me. We want to talk right from verse 5. Right from verse 5. And this is promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit is present among you don't be afraid if you read up a little bit before then God asks a question he says who is left among you who saw the house in its former glory how does it look to you now doesn't it seem like nothing to you even so, be strong, Zerubbabel, and this is the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua. He says, the high priest, be strong, all you inhabitants of the land. Listen, I, I want to talk to you as the Spirit will give us guidance today from this sermonic topic, the reestablishment of glory. The reestablishment of glory. Let us pray. God, we thank you for you are awesome in all your power awesome in all your wonder awesome father god in your majesty god we pray lord that you would be with us for these few moments these preaching moments god that somebody be healed set free saved and delivered god lord we pray lord that somebody might be also encouraged lord through this word god i admit to you i'm not worthy but i stand here available if you would please take me down into your storehouse of knowledge bring me up god with your court of love father god stabilize my mind that it might only hear from you Bless my tongue, God, Lord, that it might speak, God, of one that is learned, Lord, that can rightly divide the word of truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Haggai, second chapter. And if we read on, it says, For the Lord of hosts says, Once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that treasures of the nations will come. And I will fill the house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver and the gold belong to me. This is my declaration of the Lord of hosts. And the final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of hosts. I will provide peace in this place. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts, the reestablishment of glory. Um, sometimes we don't really understand what glory means we we talk about how something is glorious um, how it is to be admonished how it is to be uh, worship if you will how it is to look at something and say that looks glorious however we want to go a little further with the Lord or with the word glory because sometimes again our westernized understanding of biblical words sometimes is scarred uh, but glory, if you would, um, is somewhere in the Hebrew where they call the kavod or the kavod of God, meaning the grave, the seriousness, the weighted down of his presence. Uh, another word to identify glory uh, post-biblical times would be shekinah, meaning it settles, it inhabits, or it dwells. 
And the thing about Shekinah, and we add glory to the end of it, is just not something that you look at. But Shekinah is something, it's not temporary, it's not limited by time. But when we talk about the glory of God, we talk about that which dwells, and it is continuous. And I don't know about you, but I, I shout and I get joy because I've noticed that God's Shekinah glory, his kabod, has been with me. It's been dealing with me. And what I'm so glad is that even in the middle of everything that I go through, I can still count on God's glory. However, when we talk about the reestablishment of something, we, we talk about things that have been torn down but built back up. When we talk about the reestablishment, we look at things uh, as they once were and envision them of how they shall return and be again. When someone wants to get back with their boo, it's the reestablishments. It's, it's trying to get that thing back together. When things are in disarray and it's just not going as you're used for, uh, used for them to go, well, the question is you got to bring it back to a place where you're reestablishing what some would call normalcy. Uh, we can take in our current time of pandemic. Uh, it's in a disarray. It's, it has been uh, somewhat sabotaged by this thing called COVID-19. And some of us are waiting for the reestablishment of economy, the, re the reestablishment of normalcy. Uh, we're trying to reestablish uh, the principles by which we used to live by. We're trying to get back where we used to be. It's the reestablishment of something. But, but, but listen, in the text we have, uh, something that's familiar because we're talking about the children of Israel coming out of captivity. But the reality is in this text, they've been out of they've been out of captivity, the second captivity in Babylon. They've been out now for a few years. But when they came out of captivity, when they got back to Jerusalem, it looked like where uh, they just came from. It didn't look like what they what, what it used to look like. It didn't look like the city that they left. It didn't look like the temple that they used to have. And so um, coming back to Jerusalem in this time is kind of chaotic for them because they've had to learn how to live in captivity and come to a place and live in a place that doesn't look like where they've been from. It, it's, it's a crazy uh, notion, if you will, because they're now in a place where uh, the streets are not how they used to be. This is not how I remember it. Uh, for some of you all who left home and then came back, sometimes when you come back, it's in disarray because the streets don't flow like they used to flow. It's in disarray because the shop that used to be there is no longer there. And, and so to reestablish now their community is what they're trying to do. But can, I, but can I warn you for a moment that when you're trying to reestablish something, it doesn't come easy. Uh, what, I, what I am convinced of is that when you're trying to get something where it used to be, uh, that sometimes you are so invested on how, you, how something used to make you feel, how something uh, used to jog your memory, how, how something used to be glorious to you, that oftentimes you get discouraged when what it used to look like is no longer what you see now. And you're working so hard to get there. But what happens when you've been working for 15 years and you have made no progress to what you're trying to establish? And so here it is in the text this is where we find ourselves that we have somebody, the leader now of Judah named Zerubbabel. He is a man that is uh, now charged with a few things and he's charged with now reestablishing and rebuilding the temple of God. But you've got to understand that uh, uh, this king is, is not any ordinary person because he has some insight to some stuff that some of us might not have insight to. Uh, but although he has to reestablish it, it came with some turmoil. It came uh, with some headache. It came with some resistance. And can I just pause parenthetically and say this for a moment? That whenever you're trying to do something for God, when you're trying to reestablish principles, when you're trying to move forward, hear me now, you're always going to be faced with opposition. Because what I've discovered is uh, bad doesn't like good and, and ugly doesn't like pretty. And whenever you're trying to move in the opposite direction, you're going to have opposition. 
And here it is. He has to rebuild the temple. And here in Haggai, we have this minor prophet, if you would, speaking to Zerubbabel. And he begins to tell him exactly what the Lord of hosts is saying to him. He says, listen, here, right here in the beginning, it, it, it's right there. And he, he begins to talk about, listen, here, you have to reestablish what God has already put your hands to do. He begins to take him on a journey. And he says, look at the temple. He says, do any of you all remember what it used to look like? And he says, or, or does this mean absolutely nothing to you anymore? He tells them, but listen, there's some things you're going to have to do to get this thing in order. And here we are. We have Zerubbabel, and he's sitting here talking. But again, Zerubbabel is not just any other, any ordinary king. He is somebody who was born into captivity. His name means to be born in Babel, which simply means to be born in Babylon. He is born in a time where they are captive from the land that God promised them. But he is the grandson of the former king, uh, Jehozadak. He is the one uh, that came to Jerusalem really under King Cyrus. And, but now he's under King Darius. So here it is. Now from one king to the next, this leads us to believe that um, now under King Darius was not the first time the Lord came to him and gave him orders to build the temple. But if he came under King Cyrus, which simply means he's been from one leader to the next and has not established what God told him to establish, which simply you have to go back to the book of Ezra to really understand the calamity of what this king, uh, Zerubbabel, is really going through. Because when he came back under King Cyrus, he had all the opposition that he could find. People tried to help him build it. He wouldn't let him build it because he says, listen, y'all don't have the hands of the king. So you all can't come here and try to build the Lord's house. He he had opposition. And now this makes uh, this makes Haggai uh, Haggai. The first chapter really makes sense. Now you got to go back to Haggai, the first chapter where it says, listen, you all have built your pretty homes. But the house of the Lord sits here in ruins, which simply means for 15 years, they made sure that their house was in order. They made made sure that they had the best choices of windows and the best doors to walk through. And, and, and if we can make uh, their reality meet our reality, they had the nice granite tabletops and they had the nice wooden floors and they had the best paint uh, that, that uh, you could get from Lowe's and Home Depot. They had their house decked out. And finally, God got upset and simply said, how does your house look better than mine? And so he begins to talk to them and say, listen, um, uh, you, you want to know the reason why you're going through what you're going through? I need somebody to catch this. He says, that's why you work, but your pockets are always empty. He says, that's the reason why you have on clothes, but you're never warm. He says, that's the reason why you eat, but you're never full. He says that you drink, but you're never merry. And this is the reason why. It says, because you filled your house, but you haven't filled my house. Can I just pause parenthetically and maybe send a word of conviction to someone that we have to make sure we keep the main thing, the main thing. And how in the world do you want your house to be blessed, but God's house is not blessed? How in the world do you want your house to have everything, but God's house doesn't have everything? And God simply says, consider your ways, people, that I've let you out of bondage 15 years. And for 15 years, the only thing you built was a foundation. And for 15 years, hear me now, there was a foundation with nothing on it. And I came by to re-energize somebody this morning and say, go back and revisit the dream that you laid the foundation on, but you haven't built the building on it. Go back and revisit uh, the thing that God told you to go after, but you just sat and did your research, but never. Go back and finish that degree that you started. Go back and write the book that you have hidden in a couple of notepads. Go back and do what God called you to do. And Zerubbabel has to now sit back and he gains some strength a little bit. But listen, I came by just to shout somebody for a few moments and say that um, God has to do a few things with you before you can begin to do a few things for God. Here's my, uh, uh, my, my first point, if, if, if you will, and it's right here in the text. It's, it, it, it's really not hard uh, to envision. Before they rebuild the temple, hear me now, God has to begin to do something in them. He appeals to them, and this is what he, he says to them. You've seen what it looks like, but listen, before you can rebuild my temple, I've got to rebuild some things in you. I've got to do some things in you that I haven't done before. So God must rebuild them.
before they begin to rebuild the temple. And this is what God does. It's found right here in your text. He begins to uh, strengthen their reestablishment by letting them know that you have a promise that's wrapped on you. Hear me now. The only way that he's going to get the, the temple built uh, in Judah, in Jerusalem, is he says, listen, I'm going to use your hands. But before I use your hands, I've got to strengthen who you are. And can I just stop and tell somebody, could it be that a lot of times we're trying to be strong for other people and you haven't learned how to be strong for yourself? We're trying to be strong for the family, and you haven't learned how to be strong in God. You're trying to do God's things God's way, but you have not allowed God to strengthen you. But I hear the word of God saying that, uh, hear me now, that when you're weak, then he's strong. And then so if God is strong for me, I can sit back and try to do things God's way, and you haven't allowed the God to strengthen you in God's way. So here it is. Some of us try to do things at our own strength. We try to do things in our own way. But God's saying, listen, your hands will fail with doing the work if you don't let me strengthen who you are. And there are a few people that know what it's like for God to have to strengthen you. You thought you had all the power in the world, but it wasn't to God strengthen your faith that you were able to run on and see what the end was going to be. It wasn't until God strengthened your joy before you were able to sit back and shout glory, hallelujah, and it have substance. It wasn't until God strengthened who you are. And this is what God does in the text. He wants the temple built, but before the temple is built, he has to build the people. And can I just stop and ask somebody something that with a few testimonies right quick? Isn't it good to know that you can do mighty things when God begins to build you up? You can do mighty things when God begins to work on you. You can, you can do mighty things when God begins to strengthen your heart. You can do mighty things. You can love more when God strengthens you. I mean, you can look past hate when God strengthens you. When he begins to rebuild the people before he rebuilds the temple. So God strengthens. He reestablishes his promises right there in verse 5. He says, remember the promise I made to you when you left Egypt. We got to go back and and look at this thing for a moment. You got to go back to Genesis and Exodus. You got to look at uh, their, their exodus from Egypt. Uh, remember uh, the cloud, the pillar that went before them and went behind them. God, God, God made sure that his glory was with them. And so simply what God is saying, listen, before you can start building my temple, I need for you to reestablish my promise. Because evidently when you was in Babylon, you forgot that I had a promise wrapped on your name. And not only did I have a promise wrapped on your name, I had a promise wrapped on the people. And my promise has never faded. And since my promise has never faded, the only way you're going to build this temple is Remember the promise that I made you. And can I tell somebody something? The reason why uh, you have to know that God has to strengthen you is because he's reestablishing his promise in you. Here's how you know God has a promise in you. Because everything that you should have failed in, God never said that failure was now your description. Everything that should have counseled you out just built you up stronger than you've ever been before. Why is that? Because God has a promise wrapped on you. And what I've discovered about God's promise is people might leave you, but God promises stick on you. People might walk away from you, but God promises will walk with you. Things might cause you to stumble, but his, but his promises keep you lifted up. Listen, people might sit back and criticize you, but his promises encourage you. Does anybody know what it's like to have a promise? Because God won't let you fail. God won't let you give up. God won't let you throw in the towel. And it might have been 15 years. It might have been five months for some of you. For some of you all, it might have been five decades. But God's promise is still on you. And he tells them, I, I got a promise that I put on you. And the promise wasn't when you went to Babylon. The promise was when I saved you over 400 and some odd years ago. And I get, this, I, get real, I get real shouty on the inside when I think about all the promises that God said that he gave me. Because all his promises in him is yea and amen, which simply means they're coming to pass and he agrees with it. And can I just tell somebody something that is good when God agrees with your future because he doesn't let your past interrupt it. It's good when God agrees agrees with your destiny because he doesn't allow everything that held you back to keep you held up and God will tell you that my promise is still on you. 
So he reestablishes the promise. But secondly, here it is. He reestablishes provision. Um, right there in verses 6 and 8, if you, if you will, he begins to say something to them. He says, uh, once more again in a little while, he says, I'm going to shake up the heavens. And not only am I going to shake up the heavens, I'm going to shake up the earth. I'm going to shake up the sea and the dry land. I will shake up all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come and it will fill my house with glory. Listen, this is what he's simply saying to him. Remember in Egypt, the promise was you're going to a land flowing with milk and honey, which simply if you have to interpret that, uh, that doesn't mean actual um, uh, uh, streams of milk and honey. Uh, what it simply means is of provision. Uh, if you ever go there, dates hang from the tree. It is, uh, it's, it's, it's sweet. It, you could just reach up and grab them anywhere you go. And so what he's simply saying with that statement is that I'm giving you a land of provision. Notice when they got back to Jerusalem from the second uh, captivity in Babylon, what the promise was in Egypt, they were not chasing after nor looking while they were free. It's amazing how uh, freedom will make you forget some things before you got in bondage. And, and here it is uh, in the text. He says, listen, I'm about to shake up some things once again. And when I shake some things up, everything that's been hidden from you, I'm bringing back to the top. He says, everything that seems like it's been hidden and buried in the land, I'm shaking it up so much that it's going to rise to the top and it's going to be exactly what you need to do, exactly what I need to get done. He says, not only that, he says, I'm shaking up the seas and, and I'm shaking up nations that nations will begin to carry their wealth to you. Not so you can get what you need, but so I can get what I desire. And, and, and listen, it reminds me of the, the, this week um, I was teaching uh, my son how to make Kool-Aid. Listen, you know, I know some of y'all are so refined now that you buy, you know, ocean spray and all these different juices. But listen, when you got uh, a 7-year-old, 11-year-old at the house, listen, you know, you buy Kool-Aid, not flavor aid. I buy Kool-Aid. And, uh, and we put all the ingredients in there. And when we put them in, he said, Daddy, what we got to do now? I said, son, I said, we got to stir it up. He said, well... Dad, why, why can't we just drink it when you put the water in there? I said, son, because all of the things that are good, <laughs> he says, at the bottom of the picture. And so we got the spoon and we start stirring it up a little bit. And the water begin to change colors. And he says, Dad, everything that was at the bottom now came to the top. I said, yes, son. He said, it's the only reason why we did that is because we disturbed the bottom. And when you disturb the bottom, it brings everything up to the top and it fills the picture. Can I just tell somebody something? Isn't it amazing that God revelation can come through a picture with a few packs of Kool-Aid? And I came by to tell somebody God is about to do the same thing with you. That everything that's been buried from you, God is about to shake it up. Everything that's been hidden uh, in your past, God is about to shake it up. Not so your past will live, but everything that God spoke about you might begin to come come to the top and God says I'm shaking up the sea and the sea has to give up its riches I'm shaking up the earth and the earth is going to have to give up its riches and when I and when they begin to give it up you're not going to have to chase your enemies but nations will come to you and give you exactly what you need to build exactly what I desire can I just tell somebody something you ought to just type God shake me up because when God begins to shake you up just like the water that changed colors, watch your life begin to change. Just like the picture that changed colors, watch your destiny begin to take hold. Just like the picture that changed, watch the picture of your life begin to change. I wish I had a few believers out there that can say, God, whatever you do, shake me up. Shake up the earth and give me my new, just shake up, Father God, the seas, God, and give up riches. God, listen, I don't need another check. I, I, don't, I, I don't need... Uh, 
another handout, but if you just shake up some provision, if you just shake up some resources, if you just shake up some ideas, if you just shake up, Father God, some talents within me, if you just shake up some things, God, I'll let everything else give all the provision that it needs. And God is reestablishing provision for them so they can go forth and do what God needs them to do. When I speak and declare over everybody that has their hand raised with faith right now, God is about to reestablish some provision in your life. And watch nothing in your house go empty. Watch nothing in your life go lacking. Watch nothing in your health decline. Because God is reestablishing provision. And everybody that thought you were cast out, God shook you up. And he's about to confine the wisdom of your enemies and of all your haters. Why is that? Because God says, not only am I reestablishing uh, my promise on you, but I'm giving you new provision you've never ever seen before. Watch out, somebody. God's about to bless you. Listen, don't you, don't you hide too long. God's about to bless you. Zerubbabel, it's been 15 years, but God's about to shake some things up. It's been 15 years, but God is about to give up some things underneath the sea. It's been 15 years, and nations are about to come to you. And I wish I had some people of faith out there to say, God, shake up and give me some more provision. Shake me up and watch you feel my house like you've never filled it before. God is shaking up and reestablishing some provision. But, but that's not the last part of it. Um, God does something else after he reestablishes them. He, he reestablishes their promise. He reestablishes their provision. But you got to read further down. Then he gives a promise on top of a promise. God is the only person that I know they can take little and make a whole lot out of it. God is the only person I know that will watch you mess up and still see the best in you. God is the only person I know that will wait on you um, until you get some stuff together but force you to do exactly what he called you to do. It's been 15 years, Zerubbabel, but he's still calling you. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking to today. It's been 15 years, but he still has you on his mind. It's been 15 years, and he's still thinking about what your hands can do. I mean, this is what he tells him. He says, not only am I going to uh, reestablish the promise, not only am I going to reestablish provision, but you got to read further down. This is this is where I begin to get a little excited. Um, he says, the silver and the gold, they all belong to me. Um, so the provision is just not in what you see, but it's in the quality of the resources. Okay, Pastor, you, you lost me. What were you talking about? I was just excited a few moments ago, and you totally lost me. Bring me back in. He says, listen, I'm shaking up the earth. I'm shaking up the sea. But then he says, and the silver and gold is all mine. And he says, um, you're not about to build my house out of plywood and press wood. <laughs> you ain't about to build my house just out of anything. You, you, you're not about to build just with nothing. Uh, you, you're just not going to get the cheapest thing you can find and build my temple. He says, but since I own silver and gold, he says, all that's mine as well. And he said, since the silver and gold is all mine, he says, that's the provision that I'm giving you. See, I came by to tell somebody, see, you thought God was just going to give you what you need. No, God's going to give you quality. And when God gives you quality, he blesses your promise and he blesses your resource. So here it is. God's just not going to give you any blessing. He's going to give you the best thing he can find, not because your name is on it, but because God's name is on it. And I can rejoice with the fact that he just doesn't bless the look but it's it's deeper than what it looks like it's the quality of what you're looking at and he says I gotta bless you with the best silver and the best gold because you're building my kingdom but listen that's not the last part of the shout last part of the shout for me is when he goes down and he says not only will my house be filled with my glory uh, but he says your latter glory will be much greater than your former glory. Well, uh, Pastor, you, you, you got to talk, talk to me about this one. Um, 
There's a song that I love that says that your, your ladder will be greater than your past. And you will, uh, and you definitely will be blessed. And, and, and I love that song, and, and, but I hear that song ring it out in the text that, um, listen, I know you've been through some captivity, and I know that you, you know, had some, some failures, and I know um, you had to go uh, be a, a slave for about 70 years. Um, but you've had some glory before that. I know that everything hasn't been the best in your life. Uh, but even when you were in a tough time, you didn't die. God didn't give up on you. He, 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 he didn't stop uh, um, do, doing anything for you. So he simply says, listen, if you had glory then, the glory you had then is nowhere compared to the glory that's going to be in your future. So what he's simply saying to you is, you thought you were blessed yesterday. You have not seen what today looks like. You thought you were blessed today. You don't know what tomorrow looks like. You thought you were blessed last year. You don't know what the next year is about to look like for you. You thought you were blessed last decade. You don't know what this next decade is going to look like for you. And so if I'm Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the inhabitants of the land, that's enough for me to shout and give God praise on because God says that your ladder is going going to be greater than your former, which simply means, God, if you bless me then, I know you're about to bless me over and above what I can ask or what I can think. God, if you bless me with this much, I know you're going to bless me with a whole lot more. And I wish I had a few of you all that can say, God, I don't mind living in your abundance. I don't mind living in your overflow. I don't mind living in the surplus. I don't mind living in plenty because God is just not going to bless you off of what he did yesterday but God says new blessings and new mercies I see day by day I wish I had a shout out there that can say God does just that and a whole lot more that he might have touched you yesterday but he'll fill you up today he might have provided for you yesterday but he'll give you overflow today he might have picked you up yesterday but he's going to lift you high today is there anybody that can say God God, bless my ladder. God, just don't bless my ladder, but bless my children and my, my children's children. He says your ladder glory is going to be greater than your former glory. But, but, but here's, here, here, here's, the, here's the real shout in the text, and, 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 and I'll leave you alone. Go back and do the research. Um, Zerubbabel was not necessarily the greatest uh, carpenter, the greatest uh, uh, one that could have so many great works to come from his hand. You, you have to look at someone named uh, King Herod. He called him King Herod the Great. He was one of the masters uh, in biblical times of building great edifice. He was the one um, that could make water go all the way up to a mountain and, and rest in a cistern. King Herod built so many wonderful things. Um, um, you have to go look at Solomon's portico. And, and what we find uh, in history is that uh, the temple uh, that Zerubbabel built lasted longer than anything that King Herod built or, the, or uh, Solomon's portico, uh, which, which, which simply means that uh, it was smaller in nature than any of theirs, but it lasted the longest. Well, preacher, why is this important? You've got to understand the reason why you're building. And I came out to tell somebody, God is not blessing you for you. It's never been about you. Uh, God is not blessing you just so your name can go on a plaque and on the cornerstone of the building. That's not what he's doing. But you've got to look that uh, Zerubbabel is the, uh, is the God, the grandson, rather, of King uh, Jehoshadak. And not only is he uh, the grandson of him, he comes from the Davidic line of David. And if you go back and research more of that, uh, Jesus is in, the, is in the lineage of David through Joseph. Uh, and if you go back and look at further history, it'll tell you that Jesus taught in the temple uh, that Zerubbabel built. 
<laughs> so preacher, what are you talking about? Uh, the reason why you're building my temple now is because there's someone that's coming greater than you that's about to stand in the place that you're building. So this is the reason why I need you to build the kingdom. Uh, because listen, uh, 42 generations and some generations come down the line. I got one coming by the name of Jesus that needs this place that I asked you to build. And when I told you in the text that the glory will fill the temple, I never Never told you that the glory uh, was simply in this time, but you've got to understand that glory, the kabod, uh, the shekinah of God, simply means a continuous dwelling, which simply means that His glory doesn't leave; it stays there. And so, thank you, uh, Azrubabel, for building this kingdom because there's going to be one named Jesus who's coming through a virgin named Mary, and uh, He shall uh, be called Jesus and save the people from their sins and the house that you built is the place he's going to preach in one day and so can I tell somebody something don't you wait too long before you do what God told you to do you never know who's going to walk in places that you've been called to build you don't know who's going to walk in places that God has put your hands on and when God reestablishes his glory what God is saying is I'm bringing my presence not just for today but for tomorrow and the day after that and the years to come and the decades after that and I don't know about you but I can stand for my children to be in the glory of God I can stand for my grandchildren to be in the glory of God so build everything God told you to build and watch God's glory be right there go everywhere God told you to go and watch God's glory be right there build the business God told you to build watch his glory be right there write the book God told told you to write. Watch his glory be right there. Go in the places you've never been before. Watch the glory be right there. And soon and very soon, God's going to fill it so the devil can't take it. God's going to fill it so doubt can't enter in. God is going to fill it so joy will remain there. Peace will remain there. Glory will remain there. I get joy when I think about God's glory being in my life in the temple of God and so he builds this place and he tells them my glory will remain right there and some years later a man named Jesus stands in this temple and he preaches the word of God had he been unfaithful had he allowed the people of that day to deter him he never would have built what God told him to build. And isn't it amazing that although sometimes we take our time, God reestablishes his glory in you so that you can reestablish the glory on earth. Maybe there's somebody out there that says, God, reestablish me right now. Reestablish me. Endow me with your Holy Spirit. Endow me more with your glory that it might fill this place as it's never felt before. Maybe there's somebody out there that knows exactly what King Zerubbabel feels like, or rather uh, the leader of the people of Judah and Jerusalem. That sometimes God sends us into some hard places to do some hard things. But God is reestablishing. I hear God saying this. He's reestablishing some promises he's reestablishing provision he's reestablishing his glory listen I want to pray with you and for you God we thank you now for reestablishing your glory in us Lord so I pray in the name of Jesus Lord that you would send your glory like you've never sent it before God that you would bless us Father God like you've never blessed us before give our hands strength God to do exactly what you called us to do give our hands strength, God, to build exactly what you told us to build. God, not just buildings and homes, Father God, Lord, but you've called us to build ministries. You've called us to build uh, businesses for you, God, that your name will be on it. God, you've called us to build families, Father God, and build marriages, Lord, and, and build communities, God, and build youth and build children, God. And so, God, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, and not only do you bless us, Father God, 
to reestablish your provision, God. But I thank you, Lord, for giving us not just anything, God, but giving us quality. So, God, there might be someone out there, Lord, who has put the plan down. Who became weary, Father God, in well-doing. And their season of reaping has not yet come. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would come as Haggai came to Zerubbabel. Reestablish and reunite, Father God. Ignite, rather, if you will, a fire underneath them, Lord, that will burn bright for you and build kingdoms in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe there's somebody out there you're not saved today, but you don't want your life to remain that way. And you want to lift your hands and give God your life today. Listen, I can't save you, but I can introduce you to a man that can save your soul. Listen, if that's you right now, I dare you just to lift your hands where you are and repeat after me, Lord, I've sinned against your will, but I believe in my heart. And I confess it with my mouth that God, you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. And he rose again. And the Bible tells me that I'm saved. Amen. Listen, if you said that, I want you to know that you're saved today. I want to know that God has, has lifted the burden of sin off of your life. Not saying that you won't ever sin again, but you have direct access to God. What it simply means is you made a decision and a choice to give him your, not just your hand, but your heart and your life. And I'm excited for you. If you would, go to gracechurchraleigh.org. Click on the connect button, if you will. Just give us your name, your number, tell you that you gave your life to Christ, and we're going to give you a call so that we want to celebrate with you if that's all right. In the name of Jesus, amen. Listen, it's giving times, children of God. And there's many ways that you can give and bless the kingdom of God. We have our GiveLify. Um, not only GiveLify, you can go uh, to Cash App, and it's the dollar sign, Grace Church Raleigh. You can give that way. Also, we have text to give. And then it'll come on the screen for you. If you would, please make sure that as we're, as we're being blessed by God, that we still bless the kingdom of God. Amen? Um, and so that we might be able uh, to make sure that we're doing the necessary things for ministry to go forth. I want to thank everybody who gives on a weekly basis. And I want you to know that your blessing to the kingdom of God is definitely allowing ministry here at Grace Church to go forth. There's a lot of great announcements that we do have uh, for, for us, and they're found right there in your bulletin. If you would, please make sure that you pull that up. It's a virtual bulletin. Uh, you can go to events at Grace on our webpage at gracechurchraleigh.org, and you can find all the announcements that are there. I want to thank everybody who wished First Lady a, a happy birthday uh, yesterday. Please know that your acts of kindness, um, they we do not take that for granted. Thank you so much. You don't have to be nice, but it's nice that you are, and thank you for everything that you uh, definitely uh, have, have done. Uh, listen, I want you to stay encouraged uh, through this. We'll be coming out with some more uh, guidelines as I know everything is reopening, but uh, we're going to be safe here at Grace Church, and we'll have some things that we want to talk with you about. Please make sure that you tune in to Bible study at 6, uh, 630 uh, right here on uh, Facebook. Uh, also, uh, we have our staycation uh, Bible school that it's going to be on 7 o'clock on Thursdays, 7 o'clock on Thursdays. And so we ask that you please click on the Zoom link um, that will be in the Facebook thread, and, uh, and we'll email it out to those who are on the email thread as well. And join us for Staycation Bible School. We're having a wonderful time learning great things about the kingdom of God. Amen? Listen, I love you all with the love of Christ. Remain faithful to God in this season. Remain faithful in giving. Remain faithful in worship because I know that our God is remaining faithful to us. And until next time that we worship together again, may God's blessings and peace flow and be upon you and your family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.